good evening. Good to see you all here this evening. Hope the events went well this afternoon with the kids, and I can't wait to hear about those. If you'd like to open to Colossians chapter 3 this evening, Colossians chapter 3, we're going to be in verse 17. It's a couple months ago, uh, our kids had a, they take karate lessons, and so they had a, a test, you know, they take these belt tests where they can go up to the next color belt if they do well, and, and uh, I was sitting next to one of the dads of another kid, and he was telling me that he just really had a hard time getting his kid to, to really like any activity. You know, they had tried all kinds of sports and all kinds of things, and he just really seemed, he would do it, but he was just, he just hated all the activities that they did. And so on the way to the test that evening, he had said, you know, uh, after this test tonight, if you don't like this, you know, you can quit and we'll, we'll try something else. And the kid was like, why would I quit? I love it, you know. And, and he just kind of had this, uh, he was showing up to karate in the beginning, and he was just doing it because he had to, right? Dad says, I have to do this. But over the course of time, he got to where he really wanted to do it for himself. He, he wasn't just doing it because he had to. He did it because he wanted to. And I think, in large part, that is part of the idea of Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, he says, Whatever you do, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God our Father through him. And so, you know, I'm sure that, that we've looked at this verse before in the idea of, of, uh, of everything that we do as people falls under the authority of Jesus Christ. And, and that is true. That is what this verse is about. But within this verse is very much the idea of why we do it. And in large part, the idea of why we do it has to do with our attitude about the church. And we know that because of the book of Colossians in general. If you go back to the beginning, and very briefly, we'll just review sort of the context of the book of Colossians. Back to the beginning, you see that it has a very church-first context. He starts in verses 1 through 18, and he describes in great detail how the Apostle Paul reminds the Christians in Colossae that they have a common origin of their faith, that they have a common faith, they believe the same thing. And that they, they have learned this and come to these same beliefs together. And so Jesus Christ is the origin of their faith. And he is the reason for their faith. And so they have so much to share, so much in common, so much important things that has brought them together in the first place. And he continues then in verses 19 to 29. And he describes how though they were different cultures, and you know, that's the ever talked about Jew and Gentile and the difficulties between those cultures. Though they were different cultures, they came together under one head so that those, that culture wasn't so important anymore. And what really mattered was this shared faith, this shared belief that all had its origins in Christ and the one who had brought them together. Notice verse 24, he says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, and that he preaches everywhere and warns and teaches every man in all wisdom, verse 28, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And so they have been brought together under him, and therefore their togetherness must be important. And so he continues then, and he tells us in chapter 2, chapter 2 he tells us in verses 1 through 10 that he feels concerned about them. He's concerned because they've begun to listen to what he calls empty words, what he calls uh, doctrines that are, are false and useless, he says. They're useless doctrines. And they're doctrines that would separate Jew and Gentile into different groups again. They would take what Christ had brought together, and that's verses 11 to 23. He says, didn't Christ give all to bring you together? Didn't he die on the cross so that people of any culture could be under one head? What a shame to separate them. You know, that happened in the book of Romans. Paul wrote the book of Romans because the emperor had kicked all the Jews out of Rome. And then when the next emperor let them come back in, the Gentiles said, you know, we think we liked it better when you weren't here. <laughs> and you can kind of understand that. The Jews had a tendency to want to um, in, put the law of Moses over everybody else and say, you have to be circumcised, you have to do all these things. And so the Gentiles said, you know, I don't know, it, maybe it was really better when you weren't here. And the Jews said, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe we should be different churches. And Paul wrote the book of Romans and said, in chapters 1 through 3, remember, the Jews have sinned, the Gentiles sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's why we all need to be together 
in Christ. There's this great emphasis in chapter 2 on what Christ brought together. Notice chapter 2 and verse 12. He says that everyone who was buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwritings of requirement, that's the law of Moses, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, having no to the cross. And he goes on to describe how they have been brought together, but that these doctrines are beginning to separate them. And so that's why he says in chapter 3, in verses 1 through 4, that we have to see one another through the lens of how heaven sees each other, how heaven sees each of us. You know, it's kind of amazing. You think about this morning, uh, the, we had Aaron and, uh, and some of the men who were in that program. And, you know, there are some places in the world where those men, just because of, of their struggles, would not be welcome. But they're always welcome in the house of God, aren't they? They're always welcome with God's people because they are clearly trying to change and to be a part of God's people. How can people who are so different, who have such different backgrounds and different cultures, you read Acts chapter 1, the 120 who were gathered together, and you know, it describes Simon the Zealot, who wanted to, you know, start a war to throw overthrow Rome, and then it describes Matthew the tax collector, and of course he worked for the empire of Rome, and all of these different people who have come together. How can so many people come together? It's because we can see each other through heaven's perspective. Chapter 3 and verse 1, if you were raised with Christ... That would be each of us who, chapter 2 and verse 12, were buried with him. If you were buried with him in baptism, then chapter 3 and verse 1, you were raised with Christ. And so he says, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And so he gives us some instructions. In verses 5 through 11, he describes things that we really can't be involved in, things that we need to grow past, attitudes and actions and motivations that will only ever cause division and will only ever separate people that Christ died to bring together. And then in verses, uh, verses uh, 12 through 17, he describes the opposite end of that. Here are actions and motivations that are worthy here are things that if we commit to them and we grow in them and we ask forgiveness when we fail in them and we improve in them, here are things that will bring anybody together. It doesn't matter where you come from, what you've done before, who your parents were, how much money you do or don't have. It doesn't matter. These things would bring anybody together under the head of Christ. And he says this is true of the church. And then in verses 18 to chapter 4, 1, he says this is also true in our homes. These are principles that will bring our homes together, that will increase the unity of the family. And then in verses 2 through 6 of chapter 4, he says, these are even principles that we apply to those who are outside the church in hopes that they will become one with the members of the church. Notice chapter 2, I mean chapter 4 and verse 6. In chapter 4 and verse 6, he says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. The purpose of some of those words is, you know, salt is a preserving element, you know? And so the idea is when you talk to people who are not members of the church, or members of the church either way, but the emphasis here is those who are not yet, that you're trying to preserve your relationship so it can go on a little bit longer and maybe you can have a greater influence. <laughs> that you speak with grace, with, with favor, that, that they walk away with a favorable impression of you and that you know how to answer them. You know, as 1 Peter 3, 15 says, that you've sanctified the Lord God in your hearts, that you'll know what to say to people about the faith that you are devoted to, about the God that you serve, about the faith that they could become a part of. And so even those outside of the church, we're always thinking about things from a church-first perspective. We want you to be unified with our church. And he gives us, in verses 7 through 15, some examples of people who are good at that. And then in verses 16 through 18, he gives us a charge, and he says, don't just follow examples. Be leaders in this. Be leaders in uh, uh, this mindset that Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 talks about. And so uh, this is, you can see the whole outline that I just gave you. But number 7 is where we find our text for tonight, Colossians 3, 17, that we are engaging in worthy actions. 
engaging in worthy words, engaging in things that keep us together. And that is the context that we find Colossians 3.17 in. And so when he says, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, you can see that what he's been talking about for the whole book is how important our unity as a church is. What he's been talking about for the whole book is how we cannot let false doctrines divide us, how we cannot let our backgrounds divide us, how really the only thing that can divide us is when someone chooses not to follow true doctrines. That's the only thing that should divide us. Anything else is not worth dividing over. And so he's been talking about that up to this point and beyond this point and nearly every verse that he utters that he writes down. And so that is the lens that I think it's important to look at Colossians 3.17 in because it is about our author the authority of Christ. Colossians 3.17 is about how everything that we do must be approved by Christ. But more than that, it's about how everything we do has a particular mindset. Everything that we do as individuals, as families, and as a church has a particular focus, and that is the unity of the body of Christ. And that we never want to do anything that would threaten the unity of the body of Christ. The only exception being, of course, as we said, when someone is refusing to obey Christ. And so, with that in mind, I'd like to consider just a few things from Colossians 3.17. First of all, if we have a church-first unity mindset, then we'll see that this really is an all-encompassing mindset. He says in verse 17, he says, whatever you do. And so, you know, that's, that's the idea is all-encompassing. There's, there's no part of life that's excluded from this. There's no place that you can go where your church-first mindset isn't at the forefront of your mind, whether you're in the building or with the people of God, or whether you're not in the building or not with the people of God. There is no, there is no um, uh, vacation, as it were, from a church-first mindset, because if you are in the church, you are always a Christian. If you are in the church, there's nowhere you can go where that's not true. And so if you are in the church, you are always representing the church, and you are always either helping the cause of Christ or harming the cause of Christ. And there's nowhere on earth you can go to get away from that. There's no one that you can go that that isn't true. And so he says, whatever you do, and then he, he clarifies what do means. He says, it's either in word or in deed. And then he says, do all. And so just in case, just in case we weren't quite uh, sure what whatever meant, he clarifies for us, all. And so, you know, the great question people ask, what is outside of all? Well, nothing, right? There's nothing outside of all is all encompassing. And so... Uh, all means everything. And he says that it's in word. Now, this is really fascinating. The word there for word, it's so hard to talk about the word word because you say word so many times, but the word for word is the word that we're familiar with, logos. You know, the one that says, in the beginning was the word, and the word is with God, and the word was God. It's, it's the word that's used to describe Jesus Christ himself. And it's a word that means a message that is spoken, but the emphasis of it is the thought process behind the message. It means a well-reasoned message. And so, you know, when it says Christ is the word, it means Christ came and he spoke that message to us, but it wasn't just any old message, right? It is a message that has been thought out since before time began. It is a message that was thought out in every possible way. And so when he says, whatever you do in word, the emphasis is when you speak, your thought, your words should not just be off the cuff, right? Take a moment and reason through those words. Is this something that will increase the unity of the church? Or is what I'm going to say going to hurt the unity of the church? Reason through your words before you speak them. And he says, in whatever you speak, in all that you speak, there are no words that you can speak that are excluded from this all of our words, we should at least take a moment to think out and, and ask ourselves, how does what I'm about to say impact the church? If you're talking to church members, how is what I'm going to say impact our unity together? Is this something that's going to, to hurt their feelings about matters of opinion? Is this something that's going to put me over them for something that's unimportant? Is this something that's going to uh, 
uh, you know, to create divisions where divisions are not necessary. And again, sometimes we're teaching people that they're in sin. Sometimes we're reminding people what God's word says. Those things can't be helped. If someone is making those choices, sometimes we have to say something, and there may be a, a division that's caused over that. But those are things that the Bible says we must cause divisions over. But everything else, he says, your words should be thought about a little bit before you speak. And your words should only help the church get closer together. And when you hear yourself speak words that cause division in the church, whether you intended it or you didn't intend it, something needs to be done about that. Apologies need to be made or actions need to be taken because the unity of the church is the context that this verse falls under. The unity of the church is the priority of every word that we speak. He continues and he says, not just your words, but also your deeds. And that's, it's a word, it's the word that we, I think, get energy from. And so basically it's whatever you spend your energy on. It's just whatever, any activity that you're doing, whenever you move your legs or your hands, whenever you, you walk across a room, whatever you engage, you choose to do something, you are choosing to do something that can either bring the church closer together or pull the church farther apart. And so, you know, this is in some ways maybe a little bit less obvious. You know, it's easy to see how words can pull the church apart. How can deeds pull the church apart? Well, you know, some deeds maybe, maybe at the end of the day won't make a big difference as far as that's concerned. But you, know, you think about uh, Romans chapter 14, when he talks about the, the weaker and the stronger brethren. You know, there are some instances where we can do something that technically we have the authority from the Bible to do, but we know, we've, we've learned, we've realized that somebody who is a Christian is going to, if they saw us do it, their faith is going to be weakened, which ultimately, if that doesn't get figured out, leads them away from Christ, away from the church. And so he says, even our actions, we have to think through, you know, maybe I'm allowed to do this. Maybe there's nothing technically wrong with this action, but if it's going to cause division in the church, it's not really an action worth taking. And so I can abstain from that. Paul says, you know, all things, I'm at liberty to do all things, but not all things are helpful. Not all things are beneficial. Not all things are worth it at the end of the day. And the standard for deciding what's worth it is not what feels right to me or what I like most. The standard for defining what, deciding what's worth it is Christ and his church. What's best for Christ and his church? Now, of course, you know, when we use words like all and you must and don't cause divisions, that can feel very heavy. And we know that we're all going to make mistakes in this matter. We know that we're all going to say things sometimes that we really probably shouldn't have said, you know, and, and we're going to have to go back and, and say something about it. We know that we're going to do things sometimes and think, you know, that was just a really foolish thing to do, wasn't it? And it hurt people that I did it. We're going to make mistakes. And we know that God has grace and mercy for us. If 1 John 1, 9 will confess that sin, and, and, and he will cleanse us. And, and we know that if our brother has something against us, the book of Matthew tells us to go to him and to figure out what to do about it. You know, that we know that we're going to make mistakes. That's why we always talk about if your faith is in God's people, you will fall away from God because God's people will fail you. We, we all sin. We all make mistakes. Our faith has to be in God. But that doesn't mean that what you and I choose to do with our words and actions are inconsequential. That doesn't mean they don't matter. We still want to think about those things. We still want to consider and reason through them so that all of the actions that we take, all of the words that we make, they're filtered through a mindset of, what does this do to God's church? He tells us this, the reason is because we're trying to develop a name-first mindset. Notice what he follows with, he says in verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's all under his authority. That's the idea of name. You know, it's a stop in the name of the law. Right? A policeman in and of himself has no authority. But if he invokes the name of the law, well, the law has authority. And so he says, it's by the authority of the law that I have been commissioned to stop you. So you, you have to stop, right? It's a commission to stop. That's, a, that's kind of a... Uh, but anyway, he, uh, he says... That's our mindset. We do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. But more than that, a name also implies somebody's reputation. Your name, you know, that people talk about, well, the family name. Don't, don't besmirch the family name. Don't bring shame on the family name. A name implies people, you know, when they hear your name, they automatically, if they know anything about you, think certain things right from the front, whether they're true or not, whether it's 
accurate or not, they automatically think things about you just based on your name and what they associate with it. And so if the name of Jesus Christ implies that he has a reputation in the world, the question is, do your words and do your actions bring shame or glory to that name? If they're under his authority, they can only ultimately bring him glory. Now, some people might say it's shame, and that's, remember what 1 Peter says in chapter 4. Notice 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, uh, he says starting in verse 12, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed, right? They may misunderstand what you're doing. If you are doing things under the authority of Christ, according to his plan, other people may say, well, that's foolish. You, you, you have no idea what you're doing. You shouldn't be doing it. They may blaspheme and say, well, that's, that's a ridiculous thing to do. He says, on their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, on your part, he is glorified. And so maybe they'll misunderstand it, but ultimately, at the end of all things, if you are doing things under the authority of Christ, you are bringing glory to his name. And so if Christ is the name that we're concerned about, and it's kind of like, you know, if you imagine you have a notepad, and for every word and action that you take, you need to get a signature for it, right? Do you approve of this, and do you approve of that, and is it okay if I do this, and is it okay if I say that? And, you know, if, if the, his authority is the one that we care about, his name is the one that we're concerned about, and if he is the head of the church, then the body that's attached to it is a part of what we're concerned about. If we're concerned about his name, then the church that bears his name is one that we are concerned about. And therefore, to be concerned about the name of Christ is to be concerned about the church of Christ. There's, they all end in of Christ. Right? They all go together. And so if we are doing things with his name first in our mind, then we are doing things with his church first in our mind. And everything that we do and everything that we say, we must think of through what effect it has on the body of Christ. Because as the head of the, the church, as the head of the body, he is very concerned with what happens to that body, right? You know, if, you're, if you hurt your leg or if, if somebody hurts your body, aren't, isn't your mind concerned about that? Does, doesn't it feel worried about what's going to happen or how to fix it or how to, or just, ouch, that really hurt, you know, that's all you can think about after you stub your toe. If your body gets hurt, your mind is concerned about that. Christ is the head. He is concerned about what we do to one another, about whether we are unifying one another or tearing each other apart. And so finally then, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, he says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. He ends it with a thankful mindset. And this, I think, is where we see the, the transformation. Yeah. It's one thing that we do what God says because he said to do it. You know, I, I have to be nice to the people at church. And you know, I think if we're all honest, there are some days when that's kind of hard, isn't it? You know, there are some days when the brethren are really more of a discouragement than an encouragement. Am I the only one that's ever felt that way? Right? There are some days when you think about going to see some of those people and you just think, I would rather eat a frog alive than go to see some of those people, you know? It's, it's, the church is sometimes, it, we're, like we said, we all make mistakes and we all, we all do the wrong thing sometimes. Sometimes, it's not easy to like each other. It's not easy to love each other sometimes. But this is where the transformation comes in where we go from being nice to one another and thinking about our unity first because we're told to and doing it because we want to, even, even when they're not being so perfect and so great to us, right? That's giving thanks to God the Father through him. If you cannot say whatever words you're about to say next with a, and thank the Father for that, is it really a thing worth saying? If you cannot do the next action with, and praise God for this action, is it really an action worth taking? A thankful attitude 
can swallow its pride and can use church first words and church first actions because first and foremost it trusts the father it trusts that god knows what he was doing he could have set up whatever system that he wanted to on earth to be his people he could have done it in any way that made the best sense to god and of all you know he has all power and he is all wise and all knowledgeable and of all the things in all the universe that he could have thought of to do this is what he picked and you think when you criticize the plan that god picked for unifying people for saving people you are criticizing the only plan that could really work because wouldn't if god had done it differently if there was a better way this is the way don't you think if god could have found a different way to save humanity than dying himself on the cross he would have picked a different way he says so himself in the garden he says i'm afraid to die i don't want to die i i i am shedding tears for the fact that i have to go through all of this and i am god i should never have to go through all of this but not my will but the father's will don't you think he would have picked a different way if there was one that's the way to bring salvation that's the way to save humanity and of all the things that he could have picked to bring us together to group us all the times that he could have picked for us to meet all of the this is what he picked this must be something special this must be the way for us to be together this must be the way for us to spread his message. This must be the way for us to grow and to be encouraged. Even though sometimes we go home feeling more discouraged than encouraged. We, we look at the big picture. Isn't it true that in the big picture, we're almost always more encouraged than discouraged? Isn't it true that in the big picture, we're always glad we came? And we never think, man, I wish I had just stayed home today. Isn't it true in the big picture that although we do fail sometimes, this is the thing that gets us out of bed in the morning. These are the people that when things really go bad in our lives, and maybe there are some family members that we call, but at the end of the day, the people who really are there for us day in and day out, it's these people in this room. This is what God chose to bring us together, and therefore, we can praise God for that. And we can filter every word and every deed through a thankful mindset. If I say this, it might feel good for a minute, you know, that zinger that you'd like to tell a brother or sister so-and-so because they won't leave you alone about this or they always say something about your kids doing that or whatever it is, you know. I mean, I could just zing them. I've been thinking about it for weeks. And But if I say that, can I, can I say it with a grateful heart, with a thankful attitude? Can I say that and think, and then turn around and say, Praise God that I did the right thing. You know, No, I don't think I can. If I say that, is it going to bring the church closer together? Or is it going to make me feel good for just a minute? And then I'm going to feel like a jerk afterwards, and I'm going to have the vision to deal with. So don't say it. No, well, we all make mistakes, you know, and we can, we can correct those. And God has grace for us. But our goal is to develop a mindset so that we don't say things like that, so that we don't do things like that, so that... With every word in action, we think the name of Christ is one reputation, the reputation that I'm most concerned about on the other side of this word. On the other side of this action, the name of Christ is the one that I'm most concerned about, the effect that it has. And because of that, his body, his church, is the one that I'm concerned about more than any other group on, on earth, more than my own family name, more than any other thing his church because he died for it and he made this the way to be joined with him and prepared for heaven and so why would i ever do anything that would hurt his body this evening we would love to pray for you or to counsel you to, to help you in any troubles that you have if you have difficulties with the people of god we would love to be there for you whatever it is we ask that you come forward as we stand and as we say. <clears throat>